Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Firefighters Podcast, where we seek to develop, inspire, and motivate the world of the emergency services operator through a series of wide-ranging conversations. Now, before we go any further, just hit that rate, follow, or subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening to. It's a key performance indicator for us and helps us reach even more people. Now, here's what we've got for you today. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode two of the IFA CPD Structural Firefighting and Tactical Ventilation with John McDonough and Carol Lambert. Today's session is by John McDonough. This is a presentation on introducing the non-negotiables. I'm not going to give you any more context than that because John is going to go through the entire deck as part of today's session. But once again, a quick reminder that all of these presentations that are associated with all of the sessions are available for free. If you just look in the links below on this episode, you will find the place to go to access all of these for free. So I hope you enjoy. I hope you take a lot away from it. This was one of the main elements of the, our original conversation with John when we had him on the podcast way back when. So it is one of my favorite sessions and I hope you enjoy it. Thanks for continuing to support the podcast. If you are enjoying it, if you are taking a lot away from it, be sure to share this with somebody else. Don't be selfish with that knowledge. And hopefully we can share this awareness with as many people as possible in the firefighting community and continue to develop together. So without further ado, this is John McDonough introducing the non-negotiables. I'll see you on the other side. Okay, welcome back. Um, Before I start, is there any questions... That might be outstanding just from this morning's sort of introductions. I, I didn't explain a lot about my service in a way, more about what we're doing over the next day and a half. Um, but my service is very similar to the, the UK fire service. Um, we don't, we have station officers who will be in charge of the station, but they will always turn out on the truck. So we don't tend to have, we don't have senior station officers that might just stay at the station and handle admin. That's the sense I get in many British fire services. But, um, and my job is the next one, which in American sense will be a battalion chief. You might call it, is it a watch commander you call it? So I'm still on shift on, and when we're on 24 hour shifts, we were on 1014, but 10 years ago we went to the 24s. 24 on, 24 off, 24 on, five days off. They'll take that out of our dead, dying hands. <laughs> but um, all of us travel. Some of us now fly in from interstate on, on that shift. Sydney's incredibly expensive city to sort of um, to live in, uh, to rent in or to buy in. So traditionally, we always lived an hour north or an hour south, and now people live many hours away. Um, so very rarely is it that firefighters work in the area they live. I happen to now. Um, as uh, I went back to uh, an hour north of Sydney, I'm sort of working now. So um, I was a station officer when I went to Sweden and uh, I became an inspector, which is the rank of the rank above that, um, basically to give more power to the program. And some of you guys as instructors might realize this, that some people in an organization where we have a lot of people with a lot of experience and have been in for a while, they're not going to listen to a young SO telling them how they should fight fires. So there was a lot of that happening at the beginning. Um, and then I beca- once I became an inspector, it was quite interesting. Some guys that um, certainly I would have had problems with beforehand suddenly said that all the things I was saying made sense once I got a crown on my shoulder. So once I became an inspector, to stay in o- the only job, that was the last job I could be that be operational like Carol. And um, so like I said, um, I'm what we call a duty commander and I'm on shift on C platoon. We have the four shifts. Um, I went back to operations in February 2017. Uh, It was bittersweet, but it was time to sort of really see what the effect of, well, essentially 15 years of a new way of firefighting, if you like, was happening, was going on the fire ground. Um, What disturbed me most was that as we trained recruits and sent them out, I never had a recruit come back for training that was better than when they left training in terms of their task level skills. The problem in my organization is, and I'll talk about this a little in this this afternoon's lecture, once we leave training, our task level skills sort of stop in terms of skills acquisition. You're sort of done. So everyone's a snapshot of the moment they left their initial training. For me, that was 37 years ago. Now things have changed. But there is no task, there is no skills acquisition once you leave in a sense. We just have skills maintenance programs. So we have this problem that 
I believe my organisation sees this, the task level skills as being very basic, very simple. Everyone learnt them at the college and that's where it stays in terms of how you go forward. I went back to operations but I did find that our officers, in terms of incident management, we did a lot of work in, the, in those preceding years. They sent messages that I was never capable of. Our control of the fire scene is much better than it ever was before. When I left it was sort of makes pumps four or do this. You arrived, tried to find the first arriving, who was sort of in charge. If you couldn't find the first arriving, you just did something. So we did some things twice and some things we didn't do. But every fire goes out. So we were successful in our minds and, and in some way in reality. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Gore-Tex Professional Fabrics. Now, we all know the working environment of a firefighter is filled with challenges. We face serious risks on the job, such as heat exhaustion, burns, physical and mental stress, and we frequently come into contact with high levels of toxic chemicals. Now, I have been wearing Gore-Tex for nearly two decades on the front line, working in hostile environments, tackling challenging incidents from firefighting to water incidents and in urban search and rescue environments. Gore-Tex have a well-earned reputation for protecting professionals in the fire and emergency services through their family of highly innovative, waterproof, breathable moisture barriers that exceeds global performance standards and are trusted worldwide. Gore-Tex, going further together. In the mid 90s, we went into an incident management system, which was sort of downgrading what we did at large campaign bushfires. Um, and more recently, in the last 10 years, the American Blue Card system, uh, which is an evolution of that. Is anyone aware of that system? Okay. I mean, it's still sectors and so on. Um, a guy called Brett Tarver died in Phoenix, Arizona, in, in, a, in a shopping, uh, a supermarket type fire. And what they found is that the traditional sort of incident management with multiple radio channels and a few other things, uh, their writ failed. Um, a whole range of things failed that they'd put in place to help this person. And they sort of devised or evolved that system into a three deep system of, you might have your firefighters in the structure, you've got firefighters on deck. Rather than just saying, do we have BA, writ or whatever and allocating jobs, they're just on deck. And then you'd have staging, this three deep system. And we found that the staging side of it, do that well and jobs go well. So in the last 10 years, we've been doing a lot of work in that area. We only have one radio channel as well. We used to have three, sort of to our fire comms, so we had a strategic and a tactical and a task level radio channel. What they found in the Brett Carver case was that certain really key messages didn't reach everyone, depending on what radio channel they were on. So we went to one radio channel that everyone hears at first, it seemed like that's going to be a disaster. <laughs> Everyone's going to be chatting on the radio. What do you think happens as soon as you go to one radio channel? You only say what's important on the radio. So, um, so a few things like that. Three deep system. We have an order model where we repeat what's said on the radio. And all of that's fine and works really well, but we still struggle at the task level to send good messages in terms of how the firefighter actually interacts with their comms unit and so on. So it's still a lot of type of thing, can you repeat that, right? We send a crew into a burning building, they're forced down by heat, they're down in the middle of the hallway, and then we expect a CAN report, conditions, actions, needs. And then this goes on for five minutes when they're 10 feet from putting water on the fire. Is that a safe thing, right? Why are we asking for a CAN report? The IC can't run a safe fire ground without more information. So now we're going to get it off these people who have got their ass hanging out. I don't know whether that's made it safer or what. You s so all of those things we've sort of tried to work on hard at the task level. Um, but essentially, I returned to operations as a duty commander and was stressed and anxious because I was sending guys into fires which I knew their task level skills were not what they were when they left the training college. So that was over seven years ago now. There's one of my crews there. Um, I went to Metro East, which is sort of a very diverse part of Sydney, 15 fire stations. <laughs> And I wasn't sure what they were going to do inside that burning building. And yet I had trained them in a sense, I'd written the programs, I was now in charge of them. Um, as an officer, try and imagine, and I think we do this, but we're a bit delusional, we set strategies and tactics because we think we know what our guys are doing inside that burning building. My question would be, do you exactly know what they're doing inside that burning building? And I didn't. I knew what we trained them to do, but 
I was certain that if they were doing some of the, or weren't doing some of the things I was hoping they were doing, I wouldn't have sent them in. So it was about getting some sort of clarity for that. And how could I set strategies and tactics if they weren't going to do the things that I thought they were going to do? So I felt very hamstrung. I felt anxious and stressed. And then I just sort of found out that just control the things you can. I've got 15 stations on sea platoon. I'm going to roll in a certain way. And so we started to set some non-negotiables and some doctrine. This is how we operated at fires. And so this is a bit of a story about that. So I started asking two very simple questions. There's one of our recruits. Um, probably she's just gone through some door entry as a sitting, and we're talking about the effect of water and so on. The first question, are you going to gas cool at your next fire? We spent an enormous amount of effort teaching and expecting our personnel to gas cool at fires since, since the early 2000s when I came back from Sweden. And will you stay low at your next fire? So what would be the answer if you asked a random selection of your fire service, are you going to gas cool at your next fire, what would they say? Yeah. It depends. So, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> if they go, what's he want to hear? Yeah. He wants to hear yes, you know. So they may say something that they're not going to do, which you know. They know that you know that they know that you know that they're not <laughs> going to do it, right? Or they just say it depends. And what if you said, are you going to stay low at your next fire? And that's assuming you taught them that you always stay low at a fire. And that may not be the case. We used to do something like this back in the day. We don't teach that anymore, but if, if that's somewhere in your program, you can't complain if they say that I'm not going to get down low, right? But anyway, what would be the answer to the second question if you asked a random selection of your staff? Are you going to stay low at your next fire? Probably it depends, right? Depends normally means no, by the way. It's sort of another way of saying no. Or if you ask a bit more and sort of say, well, it, it, it's always that sort of, it was sort of what we taught them to say, because all situations are different. Sometimes yes, sometimes no. But if they say it depends, you have a problem. But it's what I wanted to hear 15 years ago. So we went through an evolution of step one, step two, step three, this very structured thing to know we're going to learn about fire science and we're going to be intuitive and we're going to have versatile firefighters. Well, I think that's easier said than done. So we had this sort of problem where if you look at gas cooling, we probably had a bell curve. We had the, the top of the bell curve. They gas cooled all the time. They were uh, well led. They probably had a decent fire soon after the training and had some success and they were able to put it into action into real fires. Then we had the bottom of the bell curve they're not going to do it, for whatever reason. Every organisation has them, even if it's the right thing to do, even if they're trained well, they're not going to do it, they're not very good at their job. Or they could just be pushing back and saying, well, you know, I think I know better than the people that taught me. But I think the majority of our firefighters are in the middle, where they would do it if they thought they needed to. Well, here's the problem, in, certainly inside a single container, I would say to guys, this may, elements of this may be like your next fire but it probably won't. Now, that doesn't make it bad training, but they're not going to be in a metal box, right? They're not going to have a small fire in front of them. They're not going to do some of these things that we expect them to do. So context is everything. So normally, I suspect we had something like that, and I was sending guys into burning buildings now where I wasn't sure they were going to do some of the things we taught them. Um, this is a video in... Um, uh, Canada that we took, and, and I, I don't show container videos, I, I don't think they're really appropriate, but this is in a, a structure. We're looking at a, a two sofas alight in the room, the room's probably bedroom sized. I'm about to advance up the hallway with a Canadian firefighter, and this is probably a pretty good example of what we'd expect our guys to do. And the reason I'm showing this is because I'm just wondering whether we've added the right context to this, but uh, we've got a tick looking across the hallway. It's nearly 600 degrees. It's fully involved in there, probably three megawatts. The only air it's going to get from now on is the hallway down to the left. There's another tick looking from the right to the left down the hallway. But as I just play this video, 
It'll now look at a tick down the hallway. I'll enter, we'll stay low, we'll do some gas cooling, and we'll do an indirect attack and put it out. It's about five to six metres the hallway, longer. We're flowing about 200 litres per minute on a line of 45. It's zero visibility, smokes down to the floor. We're cooling, I can see nothing, obviously. I'll share some info with the tick in a moment when he catches up. Yes, confirm. Hasn't been much gas cooling, longer one. We'll move forward, it's just a normal hallway and we'll make the fire in a moment. This is not six sheets of chipboard, it's two couches, carpet, indirect attack, out, and then a straight stream for overhaul. <coughs> that takes about 30 seconds, we had some gas cooling, stayed low, pretty much what we train our guys to do in the T-cell and the large volume cell. We use straight stream just as often as we use droplets depending on the, the situation. But the interesting thing is, I then ask my students, what do you think would happen if I didn't gas cool in that hallway? I just stayed low and advanced on the fire and put it out. What would most likely happen if I didn't? Now that's a three megawatt fire going in, fully involved room, three megawatt fire going into the hallway. What would most of your students answer to that? If I didn't gas cool, what is most likely to happen? Gases will ignite. Yeah, potentially or most likely. It's a distinction. This um, is. I'd guess a student would say definitely. Yes, because you've just spent however long saying beware of flashover, fire gas ignition, backdraft and so on. I would probably suggest, because I fought fires on the back of trucks for 15 years before there was any, I even knew what gas cooling was, that if you stayed low and moved quickly, that was 30 seconds in that hallway, most likely nothing would happen and you'd put the fire out, right? So we're really only gas cooling for that small percentage of times when, yeah, it lights up. And if we did it a hundred times, maybe it would light up five times in a in hundred. So that's why we're doing it. But the, the way we try and explain this now to our guys is, and we didn't at the beginning, was if we imagine a hundred percent of the time, I don't know if you can see the blue line there, probably 95% of the time, if we did nothing but stayed low and just advanced confidently and quickly, we could put that fire out. Probably nothing would happen. No gas cooling necessary, in reality and in hindsight, if you like. Now, I've, de <laughs> I've denoted my life to gas cooling, so don't get me wrong, I'm not saying we shouldn't gas cool, but I'm trying to put this in perspective of how, how we teach it now. But maybe 5% of that in hindsight, if we did it a hundred times, 5% five five of the time it would light up. It would roll down the hallway. The problem is, we taught our guys that if the smoke is hot, you should cool it. If it's 600 degrees, if, it's this, if it looks like this, in the container we had this, right? How do they know whether they're there or there in reality? We're asking them to make that decision. And it's an impossible decision to make because that looks and feels like that. Right? So what should we do in an environment I need to cool is indistinguishable from the one that I don't need to cool? I mean, what's the only answer to that? Just do it. Right? But we taught them to make a decision. If the smoke looks like this, if you feel this type of heat, if it's this colour and so on, it made it incredibly complex. Well, that to me is now non that's just non-negotiable now. No decision necessary. We will gas cool every time we're in smoke. Every time we're in a we will just gas cool. In other news, this episode is brought to you in partnership with MSA Safety. Today, we have them to thank for the improved firefighter safety through connectivity in their brand new connected firefighter system. At the center of the connected firefighter platform is the MSA M1 SCBA with telemetry. You can view battery life, air pressure, and estimated time remaining either independently on the M1 itself or from the lunar connected device screen. Also, still with the air status alarm information, search status, and all of this provided to the Incident Command for confident decision making during the scene. That integrates straight in with the lunar system, which is a wireless all-in-one device creating an independent search and rescue network, providing edge detection, enhanced personal thermal imaging, while simplifying post-scene reporting and data retention. One of the key parts of the Luna is their FAST system, the Firefighting Assisting Search Technology. This combines directional and distance information with thermal imaging to help find separated teammates and decrease response time. It actually connects you to the other crews in the vicinity for a unified search during the time 
time of mutual aid by instantly notifying the network of lunar devices when there is a downed crew member, allowing for a prompt search and rescue. All of this then plugs into the FireGrid system for cloud-based connectivity, real-time information, and data-driven decisions for the incident commander. It enables you to see the exact location of your firefighters on the scene. And it doesn't require you to be sat on the station. The MSA hub then provides a wireless gateway straight to the cloud, enabling wireless on-scene data for local and remote incident command for additional eyes on the scene. MSA are truly taking massive strides in the future of improved firefighter safety through connectivity. MSA is dedicated to increasing safety in the fire service through technological advancements. Various feature enhancements, new products, partnerships and integrations will provide additional capabilities readily accessible by products, software and services in the brand new MSA Connected Firefighter platform. Now back to the show. So I started to think about a, a bunch of other things we do that perhaps should just be non-negotiable, no decision process required. It's just what it takes to be good at your job. So I would show this picture here, very typical looking Australian house. It's actually an American house, but lightweight construction. It's detached. We have a decent fire. It's, it's really funny, like, you, you could ask firefighters to look at that and they could give a whole range of that's a death trap to that's okay to, um, you know, but essentially I asked, I asked the officers, the station officers, in a very sort of intimate, just station by station, I sat down with the four guys. We, we have four on a truck, SO driver and two. So we're not like the Belgians that have all of those guys. So we treat every truck like a hose. So you guys are similar, I think, four on a truck? Yep. So, sometimes three. Yeah, so we... We used to have, we got minimum manning of, of, um, of SO and 3, but in the 70s, SO and 2 in some places. Yeah, that, um, that's tough. So the boss is going in as well, I take it. Yeah. Um, and I just asked a simple question. With this fire here, why are you going offensive instead of defensive? Now, it wasn't a fire behaviour question. It wasn't, oh, the smoke's obviously very hot, it's buoyant and going straight up, and it, it, it's got some the colours this and this, and going to this extended fire behaviour. But basically, we, they would say, if my guys could be safe, I'd send them in. Is that a fair enough comment? If you're outside this burning building, would you send them in? Yeah, if they can be safe. Yeah? Yeah, that's, this is the easy question today. So. <laughs> yeah, but it's sort of one of those things, isn't it? Like, because let's, let's why am I sending them in? Well, I, I can probably put forward a pretty good argument that we can do a better job if they go in. They can, maybe there's people to find, maybe the closer you are to the fire, the more accurate you'll be with your water, we'll have less damage, we'll save more of the house. Maybe we can still keep this to the room of origin in terms of fire damage. So we tend to go in tier if we can. Certainly my organisation does. I don't know for how much longer. One thing I've seen in my career is an increasing risk aversion just in society in general, not the fire service, just everywhere, right? And I think sometimes that can lead to actually unsafe behaviour, but we can talk about that later. But essentially each, each of my SOs would say, if I thought the crew could fight this safely from inside, I would send them in because I could have a better outcome. Perfect answer. So I then turned to them and said, in other words, not any crew, but a crew that could maintain their safety. This is the only time you'll hear me talk about safety. I was talking to some guys at the pub last night and um, in a weird sort of way I, I, I've stopped talking about the techniques of, of, of gas cooling and you know understanding flashover, fire gas ignition and backdrafts as the most important thing is to make it safer for firefighters. I think our most important job is to make very good firefighters and very good firefighters are safe. You know, it's the same thing, but I'm looking at it from a different angle, right? If you want me to send you into this, I want a very good firefighter to send into that. And a very good firefighter will not find that a problem because they'll just do what you saw in the video, right? We had a, um, just a, a bit of a sidestep. Um, we have leading firefighters that have done the exams for station officer, but they haven't been made yet, so they can act up. And um, do you have a similar sort of rank that can act up? In our case, it's a sad case for some of them because they can act up for many years and, and just not 
get promoted eventually, so which is devastating. But so imagine I've got there, there are 100 fire stations in Sydney, and I, I've got a spare LF and another zone, that, another part of Sydney, they want him or her to go there and, and act up. So I'm sending them across to another fire station where they don't know who's there, and they walk in and all of the guys there have got three stripes on their shoulder, which is 15 years in our service. Senior firefighter with a stripe of, stripe of shame, the third stripe is a 15-year is a guy. What's that person feeling? What is he or she feeling when they walk into that station? They're new to this, you know, to the station officer job and they see three experienced guys sitting there. What are they thinking? Theoretically reassured. <laughs> I'm glad you added theoretical in the front of it. But yeah, they, they tend to be more assured. Yeah, at least these guys know, should know what they're doing because I'm still learning this job. And so they probably relax a little. So they go to this fire, and I'll come back to this in a, you know, where I'm heading with this, but they go to this fire and for us, out of doubt, they're going in the front door, right? And um, so he goes, okay, hose line in, I'll pull the power and I'll start a 360. He or she's now gone. What do they do? And I can guarantee they're probably in a half crouch like this. And this is how I fought fires. And they drop their head into a little bit and they're banging into stuff. Shit. Oh, fuck, you right? Yeah, shit. Hot. Going down. Are they gas cooling? No. Why? Because this is not what the container looked like. Smoke is down to the ground and it's hot, but there's none of that flame. There's nothing for me to do this to. So they're, they're taking a lot of radiation. It's hot because the end fire is throwing three megawatts of, of radiation and so on down the, halfway down the hallway and they can't put the fire out because they have to get to the end of the hallway. It's perpendicular. They can put 2,000 litres down the end of the hallway. It's not going out. Halfway down the hallway, they're forced down. This is sort of pulling the, you know, their uniforms drenched. What do they do now? They just leave. Yeah, it's not, I mean, not life-threatening really. It's just a hallway, just come back the way you came. They're bundling out the front door. They look like they've been through hell. Finish the 360. SOCs them. They go, too hot in their boss, we have to go defensive. This house burns down. Right? Or well, we lose half of it. I arrive as a duty commander. They look like they've been through hell. The house looks like it's been through hell. I don't call bullshit on this. They did everything this, you know what I mean? The people whose house it is will, will thank them. Or in an alternate universe, the, the young LF goes to another station, but this time it's all young firefighters there. What is he or she thinking as they walk into that room? Shit, <laughs> yeah, I better be really careful. There's no experience here. I don't know if these guys, are... well, I'll tell you what, if we arrive to the house, he or she's still gonna send them in, but this time they're down, they're moving fast, they're cooling, they're aggressive, they're doing everything we taught, and they just go another 10 feet. They take four times less radiation. They get an extra 10 feet, it's out. They're coming out at the same time, the young officer goes, they go, Fire's out, boss, we're just going to get the fan. What is he or she thinking happened? It's a, small fire. it's a small fire. It couldn't have been a big fire. It was exactly the same fire. Exactly the same fire. I arrive, and I'm thinking it's not a big fire. I'm trying to tell the press that it was a big fire, right? So this is, these alternate are just playing out all the time, and no one's calling bullshit on it, because they both went out, right? So when I ask my... You know, which crew are you sending in? I have this discussion with all of my crews. I play out that pantomime and the room goes silent because everyone's thinking about, well, which am I, right? Which have I been in the past? So, so what is it exactly that the crew is doing whilst inside the burning building that vindicates your decision? What are those things you're thinking about? It's sort of a rhetorical question as I'm going through this process with the with the guys, we're all sitting at the same table here. Conversely, if you knew a crew would not do certain actions, would you have gone offensive? If they had to come up to you right from the get-go and say, well, I'm not going to gas cool, I don't do that. Or maybe I'll gas cool if I see flame in the overhead, right? I mean, I've fought my fair share of fires and I must admit it's been rare for me to see flames in the overhead generally, right? 
If I had attended my own CFBT lectures as a senior firefighter back in the day, I would have said, this is great training, we should have more of it. I would have been slightly angry that we hadn't been taught this yet. Why don't we know this stuff? This is great. If I get a fire like this, I'll do it. This is for special fires, right? I, I, would, have, I, I would have been something like that. So, so knowing what these actions are is critical. So if you like, we sort of have this sort of spectrum from, it depends, all methods have merit if used in the right context. We have the standard approach, which is sort of traditional, step one, step two, step three, step four. When I came back from Sweden, I sort of threw that in the dustbin. The problem being, if you got to step five and things weren't, weren't working, we were sort of lost, right? But somewhere in the middle, I'm sort of, I want firefighters to be innovative and think outside the box, but I, I firmly believe some things are non-negotiable. So I'm trying to find out what those are. So what is a non-negotiable? So just to be very sure here, agreed upon default actions that must be employed order, in order to ensure shared expectations between the officer and the crew. So if we go back to my story about the young officer going to another station, would he or she have even sent that crew in if he or she thought that was going to be the outcome? Probably not, right? So I then turned to the crew and I asked them some questions. You're at the entry and waiting to enter. At first I just used this type of language. List four task level actions that you must perform to meet the expectations of the officer in charge. So tell me four things you think he or she wants you to do, otherwise they would not send you in. Now if you asked your firefighters that, what four would they come up with? The interesting thing is if I asked that question, I had to revise it. I was getting answers like, take a hose line, <laughs> wear breathing apparatus, have a radio, <laughs> have a thermal image camera and I go, no, 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 okay. Revised question. You're at the entry and waiting to enter. You've received training in structural firefighting, are wearing correct PPC and SCBA, have a charged hose line and are carrying a tick and a radio. Now tell me four things you think he or she wants you to do, otherwise they wouldn't have sent you in. If I had a whiteboard now, I'd have one, two, three, four. What would you guys say? You could do this two ways, what you think, but perhaps what you think the students you are teaching would answer to this question. Okay, no, that's not one of them. Well, is that, is that what they'd answer, or is that what you think they should answer, or both? Sorry? Okay, yep. Go simpler. Go much simpler. Attack the fire? Okay, that's number four. Put water on the fire as soon as possible, non-negotiable. I'm going to come back to that one because there's two other things that add context to that. That's part of the put water on the fire as soon as possible? Gas cool. cool. That's number three. So we've got put water on the fire as soon as possible, we've got gas cool. The first one's really simple. You sort of saw it play out. Stay low. Stay low. If you ask an Australian firefighter, and I must admit we've worked hard on this in the last 10 years, they will always, the first one they'll say, stay low. They're not all doing it but they'll say stay low. The th next one they'll say is gas cool, right? The next one they'll say is that now they start to struggle. They go, oh, put water on the fire? Yes, put water on the fire. But there's one more. Door. Yes, they'll say door entry. And I'll say, but what are you doing during door entry? I mean, what, what are we fundamentally? Control. Yes, we're sort of control we controlling the flow path, right? So I can get every crew to come up with those four. So they became our non-negotiables. Stay low, cool the smoke, put the fire out as soon as possible, and control the flow path. If we look at them sort of separately, the stay low, there's a whole range of things here that we have not, well certainly prior to the last 10 years, this, well we had BA, we had BA training and fire training as separate training. So first had to go to BA and learn how to, to wear BA. And during that, they taught them to move around against a wall and so on. It sort of evolved a little bit, but their argument was to meet the learning requirement of moving in a low visibility area, 
that's how they'd always done it. And when you go to fire, they will teach you what you really have to do. That's not a good thing. <laughs> so now one unit is sort of saying, we're going to teach you this, but it's not really what we expect. Uh, and then fire training will have you down low. Um, so fire training taught how to put fires out, how to operate in that environment. Um, and what else did fire training do? Obviously gas cooling and search and rescue. BA just taught, our BA now just teaches the mechanical aspects of the set. So that when they're finished doing that, they can do the fire training. Does that make sense, right? And, and in 2010, we had a restructure where the subject matter experts would now teach the, the elements. So there was sort of like every, every unit put forward what they think they should teach and search and rescue went from BA to fire training because anything done in a fire environment in terms of task level skills was now seen to, to have that contextual element to it was now done by fire training. It's very, look, we were exactly the same and we still battle these silos. We absolutely do. If you were a recruit and came into to my service, well, we still do it now, but we're a little bit better. You would have a recruit instructor, an initial skills instructor that just taught all the basics. It might be extinguishers, it might be pumps, uh, small pumps, it might be, uh, and they would teach basics, and then you would go to breathing apparatus, and they would teach you how to wear BA and some hazmat, some basic hazmat. You would then go to rescue guys, and they would do basic scene stabilization and basic hydraulics, because we have. We have rescue stations that are credited in rescue, but not every firefighter is. And then you would go to the fire guys and learn how to put fires out and search for people inside a fire environment. And, that, and that's how it is now. So a lot of instructors will defer to the other unit if that, is, if that comes up in a discussion. I'll just hold on to that thought for a moment. This is what will happen, but that will be taught to you by, by the fire guys or by the BA guys but we still have these issues. The other one's appliance training. The, lap over, the overlap there is friction loss and, and, and supplying the right amount of water. Obviously that's putting fires out, but the guys operating the pumps learn how to operate pumps in appliance training. Therefore, our understanding of friction loss and that, to put it mildly, was flawed and is still flawed to this day, right? Do you do much work on friction loss and maximum amount of water and so on? And, um, we use 38, inch, you know, but anyway, with our 38s, um, we were always taught when we have 30 metres per 38, we'd have a attack tray with two lengths and, uh, and basically, if you had, per length of 38, we want 7 bar to the nozzle, we always talk in KPA, 700 KPA to the nozzle, we would add 100 KPA per length or 1 bar per length, right? And so I learnt... 100 kPa per length of 38, 30 kPa per length of 70, and 30 per level is what everyone was taught. I got taught that 38 years ago. The problem is that's only true if you're flowing 230 litres per minute. So our nozzles will go to 475. So one, no one ever used more than 230, and if you did turn it to 475, we had a problem because no one pumped for it. <coughs> and even, even getting that extra 100 kPa per length was nearly impossible. So how many buildings did we lose because we didn't pump enough quickly enough? It was just a roll of the dice, right? One thing I'll mention now that might be interesting, our building code is, is very good for buildings over 25 metres. We have seven bar of the most disadvantaged interior hydrant in buildings above 25 metres. We don't have the flow, but we have the pressure. So it means that the techniques we teach in terms of using droplets and that apply to all of our structures not just our low rise. So there's a little bit of a difference there that we haven't had to sort of change the way we fight fires because we're only getting three bar or something. At, you know, A lot of buildings are 24.9, but anything above 25, the, the Australian building code, two stairwells, pressurized stairwells, seven bar. You know, So uh, that'll probably come into some discussions later on in terms of, of how much we have to worry about our guys in high rise fires. I've never been to a high rise fire in 38 years. In a, in a city of 5.2 million. Um, I've, I've probably been to one or two, but they were buildings that were being built because all those buildings above 25 metres are sprinkled as well. 
So we had our Grenfell actually a year and a half earlier, Docklands Fire. Very similar building, cladding, 24 levels. They evacuated 400 people through <coughs> two stairwells and 26 sprinkler heads went off. And that was that. They put it out with first aid reels inside and an air reel outside. It really was the same fire, but the systems were different, right? I mean, I don't think that's rocket science to anyone. You know, that's why we have sprinklers. It was rated for something like six sprinkler heads to go off. 26 went off. And that suppressed it enough that it just couldn't get in. And the guys put it down outside. And then inside, the, a couple of the, the reels off the wall, they just, you know. And that was a year and a half before Grenfell. Ever heard the quote that true leaders are readers? Well, we believe this is true. Listeners often ask where we go to keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in the sector globally. So there are a few key publications which I encourage you to go check out. Now, if you're looking for insights on disaster management, fire protection, and firefighting for us, we go to Asia Pacific Fire Magazine. And when you're looking for the latest on the Middle East fire protection industry and fire services, it's Gulf Fire Magazine. And our quarterly check-in is with International Firefighter Magazine, reporting to municipal, industrial, and fire training professionals. Now, next Next up and widely accepted to be the global voice for passive and active fire protection. This is a good one. It's International Fire Protection Magazine. And finally, and perhaps the most relevant to our predominantly UK audience, I'd strongly suggest subscribing to UK Fire Magazine, reporting to the United Kingdom fire protection industry and fire services. We're really excited to announce that after a long-standing relationship and mutual respect, we've now partnered with MDM Publishing, who bring you all of these essential publications. Because in a world of change, the learners shall inherit the earth, while the learned shall find themselves perfectly suited for a world that no longer exists. Eric Hoffer said that, and I believe he was right. So keep growing, keep learning, and keep yourself in the know and at the cutting edge of what's happening globally by dropping into the notes. And as a gift from the podcast, you can actually subscribe to any of these publications for free using the link in our notes. Now back to the show. PPV. Okay, what we do is uh, we only use the fan when the fire's out. We'll keep a building confined, fire's out, fan on. Not quite the story. Over the years, the fan got relegated to overhaul because guys were so afraid, movies, you know, you, YouTube movies of buildings getting crazy when the fan went. We got fans in the mid-90s, the first fans. I remember being at the station, they arrived, we had a VHS cassette from Tempest. It had PPA on it, it had PPV, it had, it had everything on it. And we just, which was normal at the time, no training, the new bit of kit just comes. And we had a couple of close calls. And um, by the early 2000s, we had safety bulletins that said the, no, no positive pressure ventilation unless the fire's out. And over the last 25 years, as we've sort of looked and done research into that, yeah, that hasn't changed. Um, and in, in increasingly, we will just keep it confined. And um, our biggest thing is now getting the fan on as quickly as we should because of this internal fear. I'll have guys pulling ceiling and stuff like that going, I'm searching for every bit of fire because I don't want to start the fan yet. So that's sort of where we're at now. But um, uh, yeah, but every truck has a fan. Um, and um, they just use, our biggest problem is everything is single glazed. So when we turn up to a fire, it's likely to be fully involved in at least one enclosure. Even if the door is shut to that enclosure, get enough temperature and the window breaks. So we'll arrive and, 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 and we'll have fire coming out of it. It may still be in that enclosure, but we can't rely on doors to keep it, right? So, you know, growth, flashover, fully involved, or you have growth and not. I mean, we're arriving to more of these than these, right? Does that make sense? So, so yeah, but our fan use, no, we won't. We're not aggressive with fans at all. In, in fact, very conservative. I'm now try, trying to drag fans up with my guys and fire out fan on. Because there's only one thing better than someone expert on the thermal image camera and that's no smoke. So we aggressively use fans in some places, but not in PPA, no. I remember back in the day, it might be Tyne and Weir and so on, but I know they were big, you know, there's, there's level one, and correct me if I'm wrong, sort of level one, the fire's out, use the fan. Level two, the fire's not out, but we know where it is. Level three, we don't know where it is, but we're going to put the fan on and find out where it is or something like that. We certainly had plans to get to that level. We just found that, and we're probably talking mid-90s now and late 90s, and a lot of stuff going around, but I mean, it's pretty straightforward. So we taught guys to have the door double the size of the outlet, right? Two to one, 
and the smoke would barrel out and you sequentially ventilate, close every other door in just one room at a time, right? And then, and Carol's probably, who did a thesis on fans and, um, and then if you're doing PPA, you've really got to have the outlet four to five times sort of bigger than the inlet so you don't get thermal runaway. Well, we found that difficult to do in the first place. Chris Garcia, a guy who sort of wrote the book on PPA, was a member of that IFIW and the original one. And I had long talks with Chris about it. And he said, look, I said, I don't think we've got guys that are well enough trained in understanding how to set that up to get the best outcome. And he said, well, I haven't got guys trained well enough to go in there in zero visibility and do this gas cooling thing. So it was quite an interesting, and he said, with the low training of his volunteer brigade, we'll put the fan there, we'll have one to four outlet, and then when the fan goes on, the fire may increase, but it'll all go out. And he said, if it doesn't, well, we're not in there, not a problem. But most of the time, we can walk in there without breathing apparatus. I'm going, that's fine, but what about any victims in there? And it was sort of, well, so that's where we sort of had a major difference. In many ways, I think PPA certainly never took positive pressure attack, fire's not out, put the fan on, never took off in Australia, never really took off in the States. And then there was a serious accident at one of their training sessions. So it's not something that, in the last 25 years, look at the UL research, which really just sort of said, look, you know, if you want to keep it simple, put water on it, then, then clear it. So that's sort of where we're at, very simple. Okay, we've got ball valve. 115, 230, 360, 475. So they can choose the flow rate. And they're just a simple ball valve with a, with a um, combination fog nozzle on the end. No, 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 no. So um, our guys essentially will probably use 115 to 230. Um, we really never train to use more than that. And I'd probably say that inside a normal residential structure, if you're using more than that and putting it in the right place, you probably shouldn't be there, right? 475 is a lot to use inside a structure. It's a heavy hose. And, um, but we were losing a lot, in my opinion, we were struggling with your, your medium commercial buildings because guys would then turn up to them and still use 115, 230 because that's the, what they were taught to gas cool with. And we could certainly get them to use more longer techniques, which we, you saw the larger props. That wasn't so much the problem. But to increase the water usage, let's, let, let's go to putting water on the fire as soon as possible. All of these things here are essentially indirect attack, direct attack, overhaul, application, exterior stream, hose handling, friction points, all flow rate. What, all of the things that are important about each one of these non-negotiables, we then start to investigate, right? So if we go to flow rate, I would say, to all my crews, and maybe put yourself in this situation, you've just arrived at a small commercial, maybe it's a warehouse, panel shop, roller shutter doors up, smoke's issuing, you arrive one pump, so for us, same as you guys, four guys, one pump arrives, they meet you out there, we've got 20 pallets of light, 20 meters in, there's a welding accident. We tried to put it out with extinguishers. Thank God you're here. Now we're gonna run a hose line in there with two guys. Maybe the smoke's all the way up here. I mean, it's a big, you know. They're gonna go in, they're gonna see that, and they're gonna apply water. So I set that scene for my guys. And I say, who's on, the, who's on the nozzle? And one guy put his hand up, right? Who's pumping? Another guy put his hand up. And I go, right. In the next two minutes, two things will happen. One of two things. You'll put it out, or it'll be a sixth alarm. So we have this window of opportunity to deal with this. What are you flowing? I get three answers. The first answer by the majority is, I don't know. That was me as a firefighter. I just open the nozzle. If the stream looks okay, I just apply it until I, can't, until I either have to retreat or it goes out. What if that stream doesn't look very nice? What do I do? What do most firefighters do? Call for an increase in what? Pressure. Just give me more pressure. The motor driver goes, mm -hmm. and suddenly the stream looks nice. They could be on 115, right? They're flowing four times less than they could. 
Now, if this doesn't go out and they have to retreat, you've got to ask the question, should this have gone out? I've never been to a debrief in my organisation where the first thing they said at a big six, seven, eighth alarm was, great, everyone's told their story, you should have called bigger, the station officers should have staged closer, and me, the duty commander, should have fed them earlier. No one says, first crew, tell me what you flowed. No one's ever asked it. So I talk to my crews and the majority can't tell me what they flowed. The second favourite answer is 2.30. And I go, why 2.30? What do you think the answer is there? It looks right. Sorry? It looks right. Yes, right. yes. Yeah. But it's also, that's the number we're always, we always use. Or some say, I don't want to run out of water. So I say, you're happy to retreat and not put it out and have a thousand still in the tank and this place burns down? That doesn't make a lot of sense. But we've given them these lack of context. And the last group will say, I'm going to turn it to 475. I'm going to use the most, all the water I've got and try and put this out. Some say I turn it to 475. Some say I turn it to 47, 46. What? The big number I turn it to, right? right? I go, fine, that's the right answer. We will not have a sixth alarm if you can put every drop you've got on at this point. Then I go to the motor driver, what are you pumping? Somehow miraculously, you know he or she has turned it to 475. What are you pumping at? And I get three more answers. What do you think the first answer is? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just waiting for them to say, give me more pressure. And then, one will, and then they'll say, oh, you're talking about friction loss. And I go, yeah. We want to get a true 475 out of that nozzle. And then if we can't put it out, hand on heart, you did everything. But if you can't prove you put every drop of water on it in this minute or so you've got, how can you hand on heart say this should burn down? Now, no one's life's at risk perhaps or anything like that, but someone works there. Maybe they were just making enough money to keep 20 people employed. People don't recover from that. I don't need to tell you guys this, but this is how I talk to my crews. It's not just about, you know, that a community mightn't recover from that. So the motor drivers will say, oh, no, nah, I, I don't know. If he tells me to give him a bit more, I give him a bit more. The second cohort says, they try and repeat what they learnt many years ago about what that might be, but they get the numbers wrong. And the third group says 100, 30 and 30, like I just said. But they're all wrong. <coughs> and I say, the one thing appliance didn't teach you was that, that that flow rate affects friction loss. And then I say to them, I say, so what 100 per length of 38, what flow rate do you think that is? And they say, 230. And they're right this time, right? It's 230. And I said, he just turned it to 475. Now, if you want to flow a true 475, you've got to add like 300 to each one of those hoses. So now, some limitations cut in. If I put a third length of 30 on, 38 on it, I can't flow 475. So I have a hose lay system now that I, that I can't flow maximum. So we need to have a, a system where the guys hop off and can always flow maximum water. And that's not something that is necessarily taught. It wasn't in my brigade. But that's super, super important. We spend a lot of time teaching this fire science and all that. I'm not saying it's not important, but then we, under, we don't put enough water on fires in the right amount of time. And that's, that's sort of key. But the key point is that flow rate, water supply, nozzle technique. We could talk all day about exterior streams. I taught guys not to do it 10 years ago, right? Hose handling, management, speed, friction points, communications, indirect attack versus direct attack, overhaul. All of those, I had a young officer that said, I want to do some training, but there's so much stuff that we haven't trained on and it's overwhelming. What should I train? What do you think is important? I said, take the four non-negotiables and write two, par two columns theoretical and practical, and then list all the things you think fall under each one of those. When we'd finished, each one of these was full of, you know, and I don't think there's a thing that I think is important in the fire service that doesn't fall under those, those, those four non-negotiables. If you're a regular listener to the podcast, then chances are you are big into your own personal development and the development of firefighters around you. So I wanted to remind you of our mobile app drill book, this is a free training and development resources made by firefighters for firefighters. Heading onto Drillbook, you will find incident debriefs, radio messages, knots and lines, quick reference guides, quizzes every single day. 
We've got useful links to the ERG, to Web Rescue, to Jessup, Euro Rescue, 10 Second Triage, National Operational Guidance, and not to mention our daily quizzes where you will find questions on extrication, casualty handling, breathing apparatus, fire development, water rescue, rope rescue, you name it. It is the go-to resource if you've got a spare five minutes on the firehouse to develop yourself and those around you. Not only that, if you're looking to get into the fire service, we've got advice on there on interview questions, interview answers. You can build your own questioning in there. And again, remember, this is built by firefighters four or five so you can add your own drills in there you can pick the drills that you find the most favorite there is literally hundreds of training ideas hundreds of drills in there remember this app is absolutely free and it grows every single day down to the contributions of our thousands and thousands of users it's freely available on android apple and you will find it in the links for this podcast remember it's called personal development the clues in the name you've got to work twice as hard on yourself as you do on the job so always be growing always be developing now let's get back to the show using a torch who has, who has their torch here? So clipped in here, right? We all do or did. Who doesn't like that shining in your eyes? Me. <laughs> so um, Juan Carlos in Spain, uh, a guy called Etienne Simons in, in, in France. So I'm working with these guys, task level skills off the scale. They don't wear it there. They turn it upside down and wear it there. And when they're down low, the only little bit of visibility you might have, they'll shine it along the ground, on, off, something's up there, off, go. Now there's a really good way of using the torch, instead of shining it in someone's eyes. Or what do you see with the torch there as you go in a fire? Yeah, you see smoke this far away from it, right? But we keep, does anyone say anything? Or is there a better way of using the torch? Thermal image camera, how many guys are using it standing up, right? If I was looking in this direction here, I'd be lucky to see your face, because we know the dead space is huge. So you see guys using it when they're standing up and they're unsure of their footing because, well, I can either go gangster and get this, or just by dropping, now no dead space. So where's the best place, plus a uniform temperature that stops it from going into high and low resolution? Little things like this, Where's that fall into? Well, staying low, I can use the torch better, right? More stable, reduced tick deads. All of these things, it's just better to stay low. So why don't people get low? It's just more difficult, right? But if there's gains to be made and that's all they do, and you want to be the best you can, or if the guy in charge says, that's fine, you want to stand up, stand by the truck, I'll just get someone else. I don't send guys into burning buildings unless they stand, stay down low. Not because it's going to be dangerous, you're just going to suck, right? It's the difference between keep putting it out in the room of origin or this house burns down. I will call bullshit on that. It's, it's pretty simple, right? I would say to my essays, look, I don't care if your crews suck. We can work on the suck. But if you send them in when you think they're better than what they are, that's when we had an un unsafe situation. Right? So stay low, control the flow path, some interesting stuff here. We've got our door entry, our terminology, wind and smoke and all these sort of things. Obviously, we teach. When I was a, a fiery, it was just kick the door, go in hard. Obviously, we want some sort of structure around that, some sort of control. But essentially, what we're doing is we're controlling the flow path by having good door entry. Door entry was a really difficult one for us. It's probably the closest we still come to make robots. To make robots. Um, it's the closest we come to having this procedure that sort of slows guys down and has them doing stuff that's not necessary in some ways. Now, I want to be very careful here. There's just a, a spectrum between a rapid uh, door entry sequence that is slow enough to take into account what's happening and, and, and keep going, and this regimented sort of open, have a look, stop, have a conversation. What did you do yesterday? Oh, well, I did this, and have another look. Do that a couple of times, don't go in after that, right? Because you just get, you know what I mean? It's it sort of, we, we had this problem where we were telling recruits, and, and you don't realise you're doing it, 
This is, the last, this is where you make the, the final decision about whether you go in or not, based on the conditions. Have you said that to recruits before doing door entry? Because it's sort of not. The officer just said you're going in. They've gone to do something else and these guys are now, I'm going to make the decision whether I go in or not. No, you're not. Right? And then you have the recruits say, what do I do if I think that he or she has told me to do something dangerous? How do you answer that question? Right? I sort of say, well, you've got to trust that this person is more experienced, but it's a group thing. If you think there's something dangerous, say so. And he or she may say, yes, I saw that. You're still going in. Or they may say, thanks, I didn't see that. Great idea. Let's do something else. And we sort of treat it like that. But at some point, we have a system that says, and, a, and, 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 and control that sort of says there's certain actions we'll do and then we'll have the best way of doing it. But we were just, we were just stalling at this door, right? Just stalling at this door when they could have been halfway up the hallway. Now, once again, which is safer? Because when they eventually go in, have they done themselves any favours by going through <coughs> each other's life story and ten different factors that they can't, ab they, they can't know anyway? They just can't know anyway, right? It's like asking for a conditions, actions and needs in the middle of the hallway when, when we're, we've stopped them from gas cooling, we've stopped them from moving, and what are they going to say? What are the conditions? Yeah, it's just black. It's just thick smoke. Now, I knew that before I sent them in. So there's a redundant message that has now made that unsafe. So my guys, I say, I don't want any messages. I've got one channel. Only message me if you finish what I asked you to do or you can't do what I asked you to do. Right? I find that works better. So I think we have some actual... We're doing it for the right reason, but we have some structures and some expectations that on a, a working fire ground perhaps aren't making things safer, they're actually making things more dangerous. Okay, smoke curtains, we should have them and we don't. These days, to put a new piece of equipment on a truck means 335 trucks across 800,000 square kilometres with a planned and funded training program before any new equipment goes in. Now. So it's a big thing to put new equipment on. Then where do you put it on the truck and how much does it weigh? Not an excuse, but I think for us, with three-storey, four-storey walk-ups, our buildings below 24 metres, 25 metres, perfect. That's what the smoke stopper was designed for. Keep the stairwell clear while I work a, a corridor. In Belgium, with double glazing and so on, that first entry door is 99% or certainly some brigades smoke stopped? Yeah. Yep, as a matter of course, because that is the only door that is coming in. In an Australian sense, if I've already got blowing out the back window or out of a window, me smoke stopping the front door when this is getting as much air as it wants from the back isn't as advantageous and in fact it sort of just makes us slower and if we have any clear air it's going to pull it down so, may, you know, so there's my excuse for not having them in our normal structures, but I wish we had them for our, for our um, stairwells and corridors in those sort of buildings, but no, we don't. So we do not manage that door very well at all because there's no one to do it. Until, and when the second station arrives, that's just another hose line. We'll use them for another fire attack or, another, or a search and rescue. So we tend not to manage that. But there is an expectation. I'll give you an example of um, where I would put a theoretical element of controlling the flow path. Um, our biggest problem is if our windows hold and they're down the hallway and maybe we've got two to three megawatts of that fire because it's only getting it through the single doorway, that's pretty tough conditions in, in here. And then we have two windows break. That goes from three to ten. Put a bit of wind behind it, these guys are now in trouble, right? So um, the sense for those guys is, I heard windows break. That's got to mean something. So that's the theoretical knowledge that we would expect about knowing the flow path and what the access to more fresh air would make to them, rather than, oh, that means nothing, just keep on going. It might mean we increase our flow rate. It might mean we retreat. It might mean we just expect that we better use more water and quickly get to that room and put it out. So, um, you know, 
There's theoretical elements of controlling the flow path, but physically control it, we struggle to. So we don't have, it, we don't have the, the stoppers. But to be true, I mean, the initial invention of it was in a sort of a, a multi-level type keep, keep the stairwell clear. And I think it's grown from that to being a very useful tool in many situations on the front doors and, and all that. Yeah, yeah. You want to add anything just from a Belgian perspective? No. I, th I threw him the pass and he threw it back. Today's podcast is powered by our partner Lifelines and their revolutionary approach to functional hydration. Just like in firefighting, water is essential for body function, but studies show more than 80% of firefighters are dehydrated. A 25-year study findings from the National Institute of Health showed poor hydration to be linked to early aging and chronic disease and even mild dehydration results in significant negative impact outcomes including headaches, exhaustion, rapid pulse, irritability and poor cognitive function. A study conducted by Yale University showed that participants who were just 1% dehydrated had a 12% increase in errors when performing tasks that required cognitive flexibility. In addition, dehydration is shown to worsen mood and attitude, contribute to confusion and poor decision making, and negatively affect memory and judgment. In other words, you really don't want your incident commander, firefighter, or for that matter, any first responder on a critical scene to be even slightly dehydrated. Mild dehydration occurs when a person is just 1.5% dehydrated, a condition that does not even trigger the third response in most people so just imagine how quickly a firefighter or any first responder can and does become dehydrated in their day-to-day -day duties which is why i address my hydration first thing every day with lifelines go into the notes for this episode and specifically check out lifelines hydro fuel and hydro og by clicking in the notes for the podcast for a clean energy solution designed for those who demand more from their day now back to the show cooling the smoke if you ask any firefighter in the last 20 years you remember that CFBT thing and they go, oh, that CBTF thing, oh, that gas, that pulsing thing. That's what they remember, which is not a bad thing. I never cooled gases. They now do that. It's ingrained in our organization after the last 20 years. Doing it with enough water and in the right place, we've still got a lot of work to do. But certainly flow rate, droplet size, distance, hose handling, you know, temperature check's another one. It's there, but... I think that's, I would defy anyone to throw some droplets up there and then make some really sound decision that whether they came down or didn't come down would be whether I would move forward or not. I mean, just, just get the angle a little wrong and your droplets are a little heavy or your flow rate's not right or something and it comes down. I was in Canada and uh, we were training their instructors and they're flowing 150 GPM in a straight stream and, and we were trying to sort of teach them some other <laughs> techniques. And I said, we have this thing called a temperature check where we'll throw some droplets up and if they survive the journey down, it's probably not that hot and, and we would use that as information to move forward. And he goes, we do that too. I get, the, I get the hose and I rate the ceiling. If water comes down, it's safe to go forward. When wouldn't water come down when you're flowing 550 litres against the ceiling of a residential house? So, you know, I think we've got to be careful if we have, if we teach things that may not be what we think they're doing, or just it's, it's impossible to, to get such a clear cut sort of yes or no out of something like that. We're just going to say, stay low, cool aggressively, and, and, and keep moving and put water on that fire in the first instance, rather than trying to sort of play with it or, or, or we're very reticent to stop guys. You know, speed is everything in a sense. And there's that balance between, and I'll talk more about this afternoon, the balance between me not knowing anything about the underpinning fire behaviour and just rushing headlong in. But I tell you what, you know, we put some fires out and that wasn't the full answer, but it, you don't want to lose that as well. You want both the knowledge and the speed to keep you safe. Putting water on the fire as soon as possible, we sort of went through that. Context is absolutely anything, everything. I've talked to a number of guys and every time I talk to my own colleagues and colleagues around the world and you guys, we know this is absolutely everything. If you leave it out, they're going to make it up or try and put the pieces together themselves. And a, a single container, you, you know, what they draw out of that themselves, it's amazing they come up with anything. So this is the context, sorry, uh, uh, coming back to, well, Mo, isn't it? Is it uh, Mo, 
Uh, yeah, just coming back to your question here, it's a really good question. This putting water on the fire as soon as possible. This, when I joined, you rescued first. And there was a sense that someone was always coming in and deal with the fire. We, we did make a fundamental mindset that first line in will be on the fire. And that sort of, you know, but the context is really important. So we say put water on the fire as soon as possible. If you have no visible victims and no better information like there's someone in the front room, first line in should be fire attack. The second bit to that is fire attack never ignores a victim and search and rescue never ignores a fire. That makes the last one, put water on the fire as soon as possible, in my opinion, unbreakable by adding those two things. Otherwise someone will go, oh yeah, well, not, what about this and what if, what if, what if, what if. But what it has allowed us to do is the overriding mindset for our firefighters is first line in fire attack. Keep your eyes open, beeline for that fire. As an accepted way that if we do have victims and they've found refuge, this is what we want to do anyway. But we won't, we won't slow down to start searching. But if we come across a body, we've had a win, fire attack, found a victim coming out, perfect, you're now fire attack, we just switch assignments and off we go again. And that was a fundamental change in my time in the fire service. So we had now developed a simple and scalable list of actions that were non-negotiable. Once again, our crew's again here, packing. they're about to go in, we take a loop, a couple of techniques that we'll, we'll look at tomorrow. That discussion, which might take three or four hours with my crews, to me was we've now got a contract. I'm going to send you into burning buildings, or certainly the station officer is, if you do the four things. And what we found was that um, all station officers were good with this because they didn't want to send anyone into a burning, burning building that wasn't going to have the best chances of doing the best job they could. And firefighters, they just wanted to meet the expectations of the officer. What's the worst thing as a firefighter when you didn't quite know what that guy or, or girl wanted you to do? Right? And then you missed. The, the best SO we ever had, well, one of the best, a good friend of mine, always he's relieving officer for that shift in a busy part of Sydney, out of west. Uh, the king he used to be called, Bob McGowan. And uh, I went up to Bob as a young officer and I said, Bob, tell me what's going through your head when you arrive at a burning building. And he said, oh shit. He says, I've never really thought of that. He said, but by the time I've, I've sent my arrival message, my guys, super fit, super motivated, they're already in there, they're experienced and they're already putting water on it. So I'm thinking, well, that's the mess, that's, that's the thing. You have that experienced crew, that aggressive, experienced crew. I then went to the, one of the senior fireys there, who became a fire instructor and is still a fire instructor many years later, and I said, Andy, I said, what's going through your head? And he said, we're trying to get in there so fast, Bob doesn't tell us to stay outside. Now, there's the gun crew, but they're missing, right? That's not shared expectations. And if something happened to those guys in that rip, tear, smash that we used to do and just get in there and... Everything, ignorance was bliss. If something happened, they'd go to Bob, what happened to the guys? You sent them in. What's he going to say? I don't know. Normally works, right? So we now, we're a little bit better than that. I sent them in because they're going to do those four things. In reality, introduce compliance. And I think we forget this in the fire service. I think we think we have it. But that part of the discussion is, I now go to the fires, and if you don't do it, we're going to talk about it. Right? In my new zone, I've been there for a year and a half now, we had a fire soon after, we'd sort of gone through this, and I arrive and the motor driver's still there, the line of, we run a line of 70, split it, and then Cleveland lay in for a really fast attack where we can flow maximum water. If we go as 70 as close as possible, the first thing is, do I just put a nozzle on it and belt it with 70? Put 2,000 litres on it. 95% of the time we're going to split it, 38 Cleveland lay straight in. What's the second arriving crew do? We want a second fire attack. They know that's there, they just go straight in. So we have a very fast attack with maximum water if necessary. So I'm coming up, he's got the hose lay and uh, he's sort of fiddling around. I said, excellent lay and he goes, yeah, we knew you were coming. In the sense I said, I'm going to turn up to the fires and if we don't do what we said we're going to do, there's a compliance element to this, right? And they get it. So what's not a non-negotiable? If you think the smoke is hot, you should cool it. That's not a non-negotiable. If the word should is used, it's probably not a non-negotiable. We just took all that language out. This is non-negotiable. Non-negotiable means it must be done. 
You should always cool hot smoke in small enclosures if the smoke layer is low and the temperature of the smoke is above 150. Is that a non-negotiable? Well, if it can't be applied to everything, if you can't sort of scale it, it's probably not a non-negotiable. We don't care if the smoke's no degrees, <laughs> we're just cooling. Non-negotiables should be scalable to all interior fire situations. When performing an exterior attack, the 150 GPM straight stream should be as steep as possible. That's straight out of UL. Not a non-negotiable though. If it describes how to do something, it's probably not a non-negotiable. Non-negotiable is you're doing this. The other, the rest, how and why is training, right? Training provides the how and why. Non-negotiables tell you what to do. We just take away the guesswork. If you think the smoke is hot, you should cool it. When the smoke is hot, you should get down low. Once again, how hot is hot, right? It might be hot for one guy, but not for another person. You go into a not so hot fire, but stay there long enough, you'll feel hot. You go in free with a fresh uniform or something that's very hot, and you won't feel that hot. Don't gas cool just because the tick. I mean, you'll never gas cool if you use a tick, right? I don't know if I've got video of it, but we can have flames in the overhead and, it's, and the tick will say 150. And it's not broken, that's just the way it is. It doesn't see flame very well, essentially, in the way that we want it to. They taught me it's got to be over 500 degrees. The tick's only saying 150, I'm good to go, right? What is too hot? All firefighters should have a basic knowledge of fire dynamics and receive realistic live fire training. We had a, a conference based on the non-negotiables in Netherlands in 2019 and, and a lot of my colleagues sort of struggled a bit with this. They thought it was a return to the bad old days of you must do this, step one, step two, step three. I don't think it is. But when they were asked for, for versions of non-negotiables, there are no non there are no non-negotiables except every firefighter should have a basic knowledge of fire dynamics and have real If I went up to you and said and you said to me, don't worry, you can send me in. I've got, a basic, I've got a basic knowledge of fire dynamics and received live fire training. That tells me nothing about what you're about to do. Does it tell me you're going to gas cool? Well, maybe. Not good enough for me anyway. It's probably a broad motherhood statement, probably not a non-negotiable. And gives me no insight into what they're going to do in that burning building in the next five minutes. All firefighters should, oh, what do we got here? All firefighters should have an open mind. Yeah. <laughs> If you tell me, I'm about to send you into the burning building and you say, well, I've got an open mind, <laughs> once again, are you going to gas cool? Are you going to stay low? Are you going to put water on the fire straight away? All firefighters should think outside the square. All firefighters should work as a team. They're not non-negotiables. But don't despair. They could be a rule of thumb, industry truism, preferred technique, best practice. All of those things are good too. But at some point, certainly within the stations, my 15 stations, it became important that we had this shared expectations, and we call it our non-negotiables. And then at the training college, even though it's not sort of written into the doctrine per se, they teach the recruits that they're the four non-negotiables. So they sort of come out with that sort of understanding that some things are non-negotiable, right? The Firefighters Podcast was created to recognize, acknowledge, inspire, and hopefully even motivate these incredible individuals who have chosen to be part of the first responder community. Our driving purpose is to create a legacy resource for the current and future generations of firefighters and first responders. We get some incredible feedback from listeners and guests. And as the podcast grows, our desire to create longevity and sustainability means that we are asking for the support of our listeners. If you want to support the podcast, if you want to get discounts to our merchandise, hoodies, clothing, coins, patches, tallies, and also access to all of the incredible documents get shared with us from our podcast guests and sector leaders, then please head over to our Patreon page. And for just £3 a month, you can support the future of the podcast. Please finally hit that follow, subscribe, or rate button on the platform you're listening. And wherever you're in the world, please support your emergency services responders. And thank you for listening.